How are your term papers coming? Term papers. No, your media diaries. Do next class. Thumbs up. I've seen thumbs up. Anybody have any questions or anything? Thank you for the thumbs up. Ron? Uh, I forgot one day that we were supposed to go without media. It's just like one or all. Uh, just your favorite one. The one, right. that, the one that's the most useful to you. Because right. that's the one that's most likely to make you feel like, whoa, what happened? Yeah, I did that one. OK, good. All right. Uh, any other questions? <coughs> Sarah's here. Uh, so. This, cla this class, next class, we're talking history of mass media, electronic media, early electronic media. So um, there's a number of reasons for doing so, partly because the you know, regulatory structure uh, starts to emerge at this time. Uh, partly just because it's interesting to see people figuring out what, what a mass media is because they didn't really understand it at the time. They didn't understand radio's potential when they first got us, you know, figured out they could use radio at all. At least they didn't see it the way we see it. So um, it's always interesting to look in the past and uh, uh, realize that, you know, what we understand now. Um, was not at all what people understood at, at another point in time. And uh, things we take for granted early on were, you know, not really, not really understood. So one thing that's fun to do, which it's probably not going to work out too well this time, but uh, of course, never does. What's my issue here? Do I have to log in in order to search the If you go to the Times or any other big paper, you will be frustrated. <laughs> I suppose I have to log in in order to find anything out. All right. Well, maybe we'll try that next time because we've got a couple of classes on history. Newspapers are like a time machine. Uh, when you go back and read, you'll find you know they're they're you know questioning themselves. Wow, radio, this new invention. Uh, how are we going to pay for it? What should we do? And uh, there are you know articles written about this. And they really, they don't have a clue. Um, I was listening to uh, also just some talk of this type of thing uh, last week, and they were talking about things written about Hitler in the 1930s before they discovered, you know, what he would, what he would be. But, you know, sort of like puff pieces about Hitler really loves dogs. And, you know, Adolf enjoys, you know, a, a, a meal of vegetables and you know, clean, clean, clean stuff or something. It's like. Unbelievable, because they had no idea, right, at the time, like what was what was going to happen. Same sort of thing for radio. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's always interesting to look back at the historical record. <laughs> I'm also having trouble finding my doc. There we go. So um, there's a lot of kind of historical details to these couple of chapters, which are maybe interesting in their own way. <coughs> But there's also um, some kind of general principles that I can point you towards that aren't necessarily in the textbook, but just things that um, I've come to believe over time uh, about media. And so when we get to them, we can get to them. Uh, I'll point them out to you. But um, starting off then with early radio, um, you know, we had the telegraph before. Uh, we had Morse code, which is you know, the way of saying it, sending coded messages across the telegraph. And uh, last week I talked about how that transformed business, especially by being able to get you know, information from one place to another a lot faster. Uh, well, when we first uh, started using radio waves, they just figured, well, this is like wireless telegraph. We can, at that time, they couldn't broadcast audio. They couldn't broadcast a voice or music or anything. <coughs> they could only do like the equivalent of dots and dashes. But already that was a huge thing because, you know, ship to shore was a big problem. You'd see a ship coming and they were like, you know, semaphoring, you know, out at people, but that was, you know, limited by the, the line of sight and stuff. And if there was a disaster, you know, you're pretty much on your own. There was no radio to kind of <coughs> clue you, anybody else in, help, we need help, we need help, you know, there was impossible. So uh, early on, the, you know, when, when they figured out that uh, uh, radio waves would work, they were thinking, oh, okay, well, we could do like a point-to-point -point electrical <coughs> communication, 
and either save money by not having to lay wires from one place to another, or you know, when wires were not practical at all, like from a boat that's moving into shore, you could radio information. So that's a lot of advantages there. They also had the phone system at the time, which of course could carry voice point to point as well, but that needed wires. So um, one of these principles of electronic media that you can see over and over again is the inventions that we know today, like radio or the internet, uh, they are the cumulative um, product of <coughs> a lot of different people putting work in. So for a shorthand, we'll often say, you know, the inventor of this device was so-and-so, or the inventor was somebody else, right? But it always turns out that a lot of people contributed to the invention of a device. It's just, again, when we look back from our vantage point, we like to simplify <coughs> things a lot. Um, so the person who's most often identified as, you know, the person who is responsible for giving us radio is Marconi. Uh, but once you know the uh, history of it all, uh, all of these other folks actually contributed a great deal. Um, so James Clark Maxwell, uh, through his research on basically energy, he was a physicist, theorized that there was something like radio energy surrounding the Earth. Heinrich Hertz, a physicist as well, who, you know, if you're in audio class uh, with me, remember, we abbreviate frequencies with uh, a couple of letters from his name, right? So Hertz uh, remembered for many things, but he was actually able to demonstrate the existence of radio waves. You know, he could, he could show people that energy actually could be communicated through the air without a wire. Interesting. Uh, Oliver Lodge. Uh, helped us realize that the energy could be kind of marshaled in frequencies so that um, uh, you could tune waves, which was real important because Marconi, Marconi had a lot of this and he's, you know, he was, he was the promoter. He was the P.T. Barnum of the radio. He was the guy who, he had a yacht called the Electra and he sailed up and down the Hudson River when he got to New York telling everybody, hey, this amazing thing, radio, and inviting journalists on. So he's remembered partly because he was a great promoter of radio. Uh, but for instance, his device, when he started out, uh, created radio waves on a broad band of frequencies, like all over the place, just like <laughs> on every frequency around. So that, of course, wouldn't have been very effective for like what we do now when we tune to a particular frequency. He had big pieces of this, but not all of it. Fessenden, a few years later, we're talking early 1900s here, um, figured out how to put audio onto those radio waves. So prior to him, it was all Morse code. But then he shocks everybody with a New Year's Eve uh, broadcast where he plays the violin and reads the Bible. And everyone who's used to hearing like Morse code on their little amateur radio sets Go, whoa, what is this? I can hear somebody talk. That's incredible, you know. And then Lee DeForest, very well known for many, many uh, uh, inventions. This is a guy who apparently didn't know a lot of physics and engineering, but he was an incredible tinkerer, like, you know, sticking stuff together and seeing how they worked. And uh, in one of the things that he was playing with was a vacuum tube, and he found that by adding an extra piece to a vacuum tube, uh, which is essentially just an amplifier, uh, he found that he could amplify a radio signal. So prior to that, you know, you'd had these little crystal sets where, you, you know, the, the best thing you could get would be kind of a weak <coughs> sound and a little earplug like this. Uh, DeForest figured out how to make this much more powerful. You could transmit further, you could hear stuff louder, okay? And he had literally hundreds of patents in all kinds of different areas. He was like a professional inventor. So at that time, that was still something you could be. And everybody wrote about you in the newspapers, like you were you know, a genius, a professional inventor, a leader for us. So those are uh, some of the people, the most important people, who got us into AM radio. So you can see there's a lot of people who are actually involved in 
what we came to know of as just radio in itself. And this is technical, of course. We haven't talked about the, the social aspect of what are we, we going to do with this thing, right? How, could, how can we deal with it? So uh, some of this stuff is pretty nicely illustrated in a documentary uh, from the BBC. So this documentary picks things up uh, just by, by showing us Hertz's, um, Hertz's experiment. And then it moves into Marconi a bit. So let's just watch a bit of this. Audio. Written by a scientist called Oliver Lodge here in the Royal Institution. Hertz used very big sparks created by a, a machine like this called an induction coil. Can you turn it on, Bill? This is to demonstrate that energy can travel through the air. It doesn't need a wire. This was connected to these metal plates with another spark gap in the middle. And uh, this acted as a sort of aerial. This was Hertz's receiver. It's simply a loop of copper wire. Well, the big spark uh, creates radio waves with enough energy to make a tiny spark jump across the gap between these balls in the receiver when they're held very close together. So, um, I'll hold these in position. OK, Bill. That's the big spark. If you look carefully, you can just see the spark jumping across the gap. These sparks are so tiny that Hertz had to let his eyes get accustomed to the dark for 15 minutes and then watch the sparks through a magnifying glass. <laughs> his apparatus only had a range of a few metres, but he had no interest in finding any practical uses for it. The first person to use radio waves for signalling was Giuliano Marconi. Marconi had been a difficult child. His mother was a Jameson from the Irish whisky distillers who had run away to Italy to be an opera singer and married an Italian landowner. She quickly got bored on his estate. There's not much going on here. I think we'll go for a little jaunt. The infant Marconi spent much of his childhood being dragged round Europe by... <coughs> Where are we going, Mama? Uh, Barcelona. Or perhaps Boulogne. He showed little interest at school and constantly irritated his father with ridiculous scientific experiments. Shortly after failing to get into university, he happened to read an article about Hertz's work. He immediately started obsessively experimenting he soon managed to transmit the signals over a mile. Still aged only 20, he arrived in England to try and sell his ideas. Marconi had found that fixing one side of the spark gap to a long vertical wire made a much better aerial than Hertz's. <coughs> This was further improved by connecting the other side of the spark gap to Earth. Apart from that, the transmitter was basically the same as Hertz's. Any electrical spark will do. Here it's being provided by the ignition circuit of Rex's pickup truck. This primitive transmitter has a surprisingly long range. Marconi also used a much more sensitive receiver called Coherer. This was based on a design by Oliver Lodge. This is my homemade version. It's just a tube of nickel filings. I made it by filing down a coin. You fix one end to the uh, aerial, another kite, uh, and the other end to the earth. And what happens is that when it detects the radio waves, its electrical resistance falls dramatically, so it acts as a sort of switch and turns on a circuit. The theory behind it's very complicated and wasn't worked out for until many years later, but it's quite simple to make it work. The only slightly complicated thing is that you have to have something to shake it to restore its high resistance at the end of each signal. So now if I signal to Rex,
This is Marconi's original equipment that he brought to England with him. This is his transmitter with an induction coil like Hertz's and these balls that concentrated the energy of the spark. One end would have been connected to the aerial. This is his receiver. The aerial went on here. This is his coherer inside the glass tube. The filings are actually in the gap in the middle. And this is the device to tap it. Marconi would have been sending a, a combination of long pulses and short pulses, uh, sending messages in Morse code. Well, this original apparatus only had a range of about three miles, but Marconi gradually increased the sensitivity of his coherers and the size of his transmitters till he was sending messages hundreds of miles. The larger transmitters had much larger spark gaps, which got very noisy, so he had to take to putting them in enclosed boxes. Marconi's early systems had a big disadvantage. They couldn't be tuned. You can hear the signal from our spark transmitter all across the short, medium and long wave bands. The reason is that sparks create chaotic waves of all sorts of different wavelengths. What was needed was a more precise transmitter than a spark. This was the solution, the tuned circuit. It suddenly all starts to look like a proper radio, but the basic parts are still quite simple. There's a coil of wire here called an inductor and a series of overlapping metal plates here called a capacitor. The electricity whizzes backwards and forwards from one to the other, oscillating thousands of times a second. The valve acts as a sort of pump, keeping the whole thing going. You can see a picture of the radio waves this tune circuit's transmitting on this oscilloscope that I've hooked up to a short aerial. If I hold it near the tune circuit and switch on, you can see how regular the oscillations or waves that uh, it's transmitting are. Now, if I compare this uh, with the spark machine, you can see just how chaotic its radio waves are. Once the tune transmitter had been perfected, spark transmitters were quickly banned for polluting the airwaves. With the problem of interference solved, Radio seemed so miraculous that it could be capable of almost anything. <coughs> Early radios did still have one limitation. They couldn't transmit speech, only the simple pulses of Morse code. Morse code still used for messages on the shortwave band, and pulse codes are also used in, for radio-controlled models. All right. So, a bit of geeky history there about the uh, uh, technical development of the radio. So, as you can see, it was very kind of low, uh, low-fi. Uh, you know, they didn't. They didn't uh, quite understand why it worked, but they had a functional, uh, functional system. And as you could see, uh, they figured out pretty early on how to also tune the radio wave. Because uh, Marconi's uh, invention was OK if you were the one and only person who was broadcasting in that little area, you know, your, your, your wave. But uh, um, as soon as you wanted more people, you know, Marconi's, you know, invention with its chaotic waves would just like basically blast away on every frequency. But by having a tuned frequency like that, you could get many people just tuned to different frequencies that could start communicating through the radio. Thoughts about Marconi? Sarah, was that, uh, was the Italian authentic in that, uh, yeah? I'm not gonna smash in your face that that was, no. no. I mean, it was just very simple. I don't think the person who was speaking was Italian, but right. yeah, the okay. exclamation like, oh, here it is. Let's do this, let's do that. Okay, okay. It's quite a, quite a... Uh, it was funny. He's, he's a funny uh, character. I mean, again, that's sort of why he's recognized as being, you know, the, uh, the, the father of radio, if you want. Um, or maybe the mother of radio. Uh, he's, uh, he's just uh, uh, the, the real promoter of the thing, you know, up and down the, uh, the uh, Hudson in his yacht, you know, telling everybody about it.
So uh, people recognize pretty quickly the, uh, the, the interest of point-to-point -point communication through the radio. Uh, you could tune to a particular emergency frequency, and when the Titanic sank, although it was a terrible disaster, uh, they, there were uh, you know, uh, a <coughs> series of radio operators on land who were able to get the distress message and put it back out to you know, eventually a boat that came to pick up the survivors and stuff. And that was heavily publicized afterwards because the Titanic, the sinking of the Titanic, was such a, you know, a big deal. Um, <clears throat> this wasn't yet a mass medium. It was still a kind of point-to-point -point medium, but um, became apparent to various radio enthusiasts afterwards that because the radio, uh, the radio signal could be broadcast, in other words, it could be cast very broadly about, uh, you could, you know, uh, from a single point, make uh, a signal and send it to, you know, multiple people, of course. Which, as we remember, the one to many is the essence of a mass medium, right? Uh, so this was, uh, um, <clears throat> this was the brainwave, really. And the person who claims the most credit for this, although, again, many people, I think, uh, had that thought, was a fellow named David <coughs> Sarnoff. David Sarnoff, who became uh, the head of uh, NBC for decades and decades. Uh, so Sarnoff, an Eastern European Jewish immigrant, came up with nothing, just hustled and hustled and was there at the right time at the birth of radio. Uh, got in with Marconi when he visited the United States um, and uh, just stuck with that invention, believed like, you know, to his core that broadcasting was going to be a business uh, and promoted the heck out of himself. He put out there the myth, apparently, that he was one of those radio operators who had received the distress call from the Titanic. Um, other things that he did uh, in the Second World War when he was already, you know, big, famous kind of president of NBC and stuff, he uh, um, got himself sent over to Europe uh, and, you know, as a kind of a civilian consultant to the U.S. Army during the Second World War, came back, had everyone call him the general. You know, for like the next couple of decades, they call, he called himself the general. So these are, you know, huge personalities who, uh, who um, you know, publicize themselves. Marconi, Sarnoff, and such. So uh, Sarnoff, uh, you can still read online if you search the radio music box memo. So this was, you know, that was just one of those documents that Sarnoff apparently wrote, or he may have had somebody write for him. But it was like a, a think piece. What should we do with radio? What kind of programming are we going to put on this now that we have this mass media? <coughs> and he said, maybe people will want to listen to music on the radio. That might be one reason. So every home will have a music box. But this one, you don't have to crank it. You know, we'll have real people perform, and uh, it will be a big hit. He also, uh, there's another piece you can find in the New York Times when they were trying to think, well, how is it going to pay for itself? And he said, we could have three gigantic radio stations broadcasting to everywhere in the United States. And we could make people pay for it that way. So in his way, he anticipated ABC, CBS, NBC as well. Although it didn't work out that they were just one or two or three gigantic stations. They were networks of smaller stations. But he had that idea too, that if we concentrate concentrate you know, uh, the creation of radio in a few powerful places, we can you know, economically reach the whole country. So he was, he was aware of a lot of stuff. Or maybe he was paying people who are smart to, <laughs> to write for him as well. But uh, there you go. So uh, by World War I, we had an AM radio system. Uh, we had a lot of people who were um, uh, enthusiasts. We did not yet have a commercial radio system, but we would pretty soon with KDKA, which is considered the first of the uh, uh, radio stations in the USA. And a very important thing was because of all those you know, warring inventors out there, radio was kind of hung up because they would make an advance and so the, the inventor of that would patent it. And then the, you know, it would be an advance, but no one else could use it without paying outrageous licensing fees to that inventor. So then they would, you know, 
like fudge something and you know create something a little different. So there were all these patent wars going on, especially between uh, Lee DeForest and everybody else. DeForest was really litigious. He had a lot of lawsuits going on. Um, and so uh, <coughs> the First World War actually really helped radio because the government just took over all the patents and said, eh, we're going to make the best possible radio system. And uh, you know, in time of war, your patent doesn't matter. So at the end of the First World War, we had two things. First of all, a much better radio system because the government, you know, the, because the government all owned all the patents at that time, they just stuck everything together and made the best possible system. And you had a lot of people who'd been in the services who had learned broadcast, you know, engineering technology as part of their job as soldiers. So they went back out into you know regular society with that knowledge and helped set up a lot of <coughs> radio stations. So that was a big thing. After World War I, uh, um, government decided, uh, you know, radio is actually really important. It could be an incredible propaganda tool. It can give us the edge in battle and stuff. We really got to watch out. Let's make sure that only Americans can actually have American uh, have have broadcasting companies. And that froze, um, that froze Marconi out, right? Because he was an Italian, probably with a British passport, but he wasn't American. Uh, so they set up um, the uh, Radio Corporation of America, RCA, very American, uh, with Marconi associated, but not uh, in the ownership position, uh, because he couldn't <coughs> be. He wasn't allowed to. So Marconi stayed in the picture, but RCA uh, uh, was created uh, for that reason. Uh, and um, a bunch of different companies got involved. RCA, AT&T, telephone company, uh, Westinghouse, you know, electronics manufacturer. So they divided up this emerging radio field. They said, well, you know, Westinghouse and RCA are going to build the, uh, the boxes. AT&T are going to lay the long distance lines that will connect up different stations into networks. And so they, they basically <coughs> rigged this industry uh, for these large companies uh, to profit from it as it was emerging. So that takes us to around the 1920s. This is you know, the beginning of the golden age of radio when basically a lot of small independent radio operators set up stations in different uh, uh, cities. And um, KDKA, as we said, one of the first ones. Um, even department stores and hotels would set up their own broadcast station because they had big, tall buildings they could put an antenna up there. You know, the problem was, you know, even though we had tunable frequencies, <coughs> you could get two people, two companies on the same frequency, right? So then you would set up a business and start broadcasting, but somebody down the block would be on the same frequency and <laughs> everything mixes together, right? And it's, it's no good. It's no good. Uh, so uh, you needed, basically, uh, you needed some regulation. We'll get there in a sec. In the early 1920s, you could see the phenomenal growth of the ownership of radio sets, right? And well, here we got a number of stations. OK, we could also, as soon as there are more stations, there are more radio sets being sold as well. Uh, but look at that, 22, there's like less than 100. And you know, by 25, there's over 500 stations and stuff. So it takes off in a big way. And people are buying those sets. And early on, uh, enough money is being generated just by selling the radio sets that they figure there's a business. But sooner or later, everyone's got a radio, right? So what are you going to do? Uh, you got two problems. Number one, uh, you need more content, right? So Because you're an independent station in a department store, you know, you have in the best music acts in town. You have in, you know, uh, the amateur <coughs> theater company that does plays and stuff. You have your kids on, but sooner or later, <coughs> there's nothing left. People reading the newspaper, that's right. You need some source of programming. Where is that going to come from? Where would you guys, where do you think it would come from, programming? The local level, it's all tapped out. Where do you think it could come from? Sorry? Everywhere, everywhere else? Everywhere else, like big city, like, a, like New York or something like that, maybe. Yeah. So you're, what you're thinking of is, is if we could just 
get like some company together that would produce this stuff and then send it out to all these local stations. All these local stations could solve your content problem by getting content given to them from somewhere else, right? So they know that there's that possibility of getting a, a signal from one station, let's say a station in New York City where the best of Broadway, you know, the vaudeville, <coughs> the music acts, everything's in New York, right? So if you could set up so that a station in New York could send their signal to a bunch of other stations, you could do it. So they called that chain broadcasting, but it's the beginning of what we know of as networks. So it's the idea that you could, you know, originate a program in one station, but send it to other stations by the telephone lines. So AT&T takes that over, and they have the exclusive right to, you know, run a phone line from New York to Chicago to wherever, and you get those live broadcasts coming out of New York simultaneously at the same time because it's all passing through those phone lines. So this is the start of station interconnection. It becomes networks. Because soon enough, RCA, you know, Sarnoff, remember Sarnoff, right, involved in RCA, he says, ah, the network jumps over and they start NBC, the National Broadcasting Corporation, uh, which is going to be the first, you know, the first network that gets out there and starts supplying this. And the way they do it is not by buying thousands of stations all over the country. That would be too expensive. Instead, they affiliate with stations. They say, hey, we've got all this great stuff coming out of New York. Join in with us, affiliate your station with us, and you'll get all these great programs from us coming out of New York. And you know, the local stations have so much need for programming that solves their problem instantly and gets people on board with networks very fast, okay? So that's the beginning of that. Uh, I said that there was a need for regulation as well. So um, what was in place uh, in the early 1900s that's relevant to radio um, are, are the copyright um, protections for music composers. So think of it at that time, we really didn't have a record industry per se. They, were, they had you know, those wax cylinders, it wasn't much, didn't sound that great. So the actual kind of popular music business was more about uh, composing popular songs and then selling the music to people who would play it at home and stuff. So um, that, in fact, is still uh, um, are the major rights, uh, one of the three rights where popular musicians still make their money, right, is uh, these, these uh, what are called performance fees, which is every time you perform a song or something, you owe the composer of that song some royalties. So this came in, as you see, uh, in 1907. By 14, ASCAP was created. So this is a comp uh, an organization. I don't know if it's a for-profit company, but this is an organization that uh, uh, takes the money on behalf of composers and then distributes it to them. Have you heard of any others uh, like this, like ASCAP? Like right now, there's some others. There's one called BMI. There's one called CSAC. So if you look in your popular music, you'll see uh, those, those are uh, other um, rights organizations. Cool. All right, we're running on here. So. In 1926, we get the foundation of, the, of NBC itself. And uh, there was an early competitor, UIB, which didn't work out, but it was folded into CBS, which was the combination of a uh, record label and some of the stations that had affiliated with UIB when it fell apart. They like, well, we need another network. CBS was in there to, uh, uh, to fill the gap. So NBC, we said, was Sarnoff, and he was there through the 1950s. So, you know, and CBS was a fellow named William Paley. Uh, so Paley had made his money in cigars, unlike Sarnoff, who came from nothing. Uh, Paley was like, you know, rich, rich guy with from cigar money, and he set up CBS. Um, so. You obviously have an exploding industry, right? And the problem of people muscling in on each other's frequencies and stuff. So the Radio Act 
Um, and then the 1927 Federal Radio Commission, they were created in order to set some standards for broadcasters. Especially in 27, they started this business of licensing radio stations and stuff so that they would um, uh, have different frequencies. So that you wouldn't have that problem of starting up a radio station and then, you know, the, the, the neighboring station wiping them out. So they issued the license. They redesigned the use of the spectrum, which means simply they saw all of the radio frequencies that were available and they divided them up in a certain way that was consistent across the United States. And then they started licensing uh, uh, stations to go on those uh, particular frequencies. Uh, regulations slowly emerged till you get like, you know, our current era where they have some control over content. Uh, but largely they're there to make sure that uh, basically the industry runs in a sort of a fair and clean way so that you can't, you know, invest all your money in a station and then have it wiped out by somebody else, right? So another principle uh, that we can revisit in many times is uh, the regula regulators, you don't need to, to write this down. It's not, not going to be on the exam or anything. Or, you know, the exam deals with stuff that's on the slides, and we'll do a Kahoot on uh, Thursday right, to preview some of the questions for the exam. But uh, basically, um, what, what I would say is regulation is necessary in order for you know, a broadcast industry to exist, but it's very often resisted. So you can see this with television, you can see this with the internet, you know, with the struggles over net neutrality now, basically. Uh, you can still see this. Um, you know, regulation, for instance, take the net neutrality issue. Uh, has everyone heard of it for that discussion, right? So what you've got is, you know, uh, during the Obama administration, a sort of a more left-leaning FCC, uh, it creates rules to treat the internet as though it's a common carrier to try to uh, make it so that uh, no content provider has any advantage over anybody else on the internet. It's a, you know, it costs the same to move your bits no matter whether you're Comcast or City College. You know? uh, the current FCC <coughs> now with a different commissioner appointed by Trump has rolled back those rules and is opening the way for uh, you know, uh, industry to compete in order to provide faster <coughs> speed access to different kinds of content. So you know, whereas the Obama group were hot on regulating, they felt it was necessary to make it all even, you know, this other tendency now, there's a pushback. Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, they all want the opportunity to make more money. So they resist the regulation. You can see that always happening. You could have seen it back in the 20s when the, you know, the radio commission, the Federal Radio Commission comes in and broadcasters are like, no, you know, you shouldn't control us. We're working this out by ourselves. So the Communications Act of 34 actually creates the FCC. So we're talking about it today. It was created in 1934 with uh, its structure of five commissioners, uh, so and, uh, political appointees, and they were um, tasked with the you know, oversight of the industry and working out a common, a, a common system. All right, there's Mutual, which also an early network that died. So that was a bunch of stations which, instead of waiting for a Sarnoff to create NBC, got together and just started sharing programming. Very much like uh, National Public Radio does now through a couple of different distribution mediums. But they, they basically originate shows in different areas and then share them out and share the cost of that. Uh, in the meantime, it's always interesting to see how other media are responding to this new upstart. So of course, print was the original mass medium. They didn't like radio. They would not cooperate with radio, and they did not give them news that they could read over the radio, at least not at first. Eventually, they caved, and there was an agreement made that radio uh, could, uh, they would share news. You could broadcast it, but only after the newspapers had released their um, afternoon issues, right? Because newspapers, believe it or not, used to publish in the morning 
and in the afternoon. They'd have two editions, right? So radio wasn't allowed to, to actually do their, by agreement. It wasn't the government in this case. It was worked out between the businesses. That fell apart pretty soon, and radio started putting news up there themselves. But that brief agreement there, the Biltmore Agreement, because it was signed at the Biltmore Hotel in 33, was that they would, uh, they, would, they would wait. Radio would wait until all the newspapers had been sold, you know, sort of <coughs> scheduled that way. Uh, some big characters, uh, Edward R. Murrow, somebody we'll talk about again, an early broadcaster. So uh, radio begins to generate its own sort of celebrity broadcasters and stuff. Which brings us maybe to uh, ah, World War II and all of that. On the eve of World War II, there was a very famous broadcast, which uh, I didn't queue up, but is, is worth hearing about. Uh, and this is uh, War of the Worlds, right? Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small... Okay, so it starts out as pretty clearly, you know, uh, a radio broadcast with all that... Uh introduction and there's a picture of Wells of course this is all on the radio uh, but as they get into it uh, it's a dramatization kind of a false documentary of what would happen if the war the world was invaded by aliens from a scientific viewpoint the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions peculiar to the planet then you're quite convinced as a scientist that living intelligence as we know it does not exist on Mars I can say the chances against it are a thousand to one and yet how do you account for these gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? Well, oops, I cannot. All right, so sooner or later, they're reporting from the field. I don't know exactly where to drop in. All right, so something lands in a field, and they pretend they're going live to a field in New Jersey, and all these characters are out there. Now, some of the more daring souls now are venturing near the edge. Yeah, the silhouettes stand out against the metal chain. <laughs> One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with the policeman. Now, the policeman wins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen, please. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll uh, move the microphone nearer, here. Now, we're not more than 25 feet away. Uh, can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson? Yes, Mr. Uh, can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say, do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? What to say? The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this earth. Friction with the earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and you can see it's cylindrical oh, just a shape. Minute. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw and the thing must be hollow. Out there. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I, I've ever witnessed. Wait a minute. Someone's calling someone or something. I can see turning out of that black hole two luminous disks. 
Or the eyes. It might be a face. Might be almost. Oh, but heavens, something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one and another one and another one. They look like tentacles to me. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body now. It's large. It's large as a bear. It glistens like wet leather. But that face, it, it, ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black and they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is that's kind of V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips. It seems to oh, those quiver and pulsate and the monster or whatever it is can hardly move. It seems weighed down by uh, possibly gravity or something. The thing's rising up now and the crowd falls back. It seems plenty. The most extraordinary experience, ladies and gentlemen, I can't find words. And, well, I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll have to stop the description so I can take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. So they, you know, uh, people responded to this, especially those who hadn't heard the very beginning of the show. They, they thought it was real. So uh, another thing that um, we could draw a kind of a, a general, general observation is in the early days of any medium, people tend to give it more credibility than it's worth. You know, it's uh, uh, when people aren't, you know, familiar with the medium, they, they start to think, oh, well, it's new. It's got to be true, right? And uh, at that time, radio had been around for a couple of decades, but uh, they weren't used to anybody, tr you know, doing like a false documentary type of thing like that. So, uh, some some listeners were, you know, um, scared enough to like jump in the car and try to drive away, <laughs> and afraid that you know we were actually being, uh, um, you know, invaded by uh, <laughs> by aliens or stuff. Uh, and so uh, Wells, the next day, actually responded to, you know, uh, all of the furor. I do apologize. You want me to speak now? I'm sorry. Of course, we are deeply shocked and deeply regretful about the results of uh, last night's broadcast. The date of the broadcast, the date of the broadcast was 1939, and it seemed, came rather as a great surprise to us that a story, a fine H.G. Wells classic fantasy, the original for so many succeeding comic strips and adventure stories and novels about a mythical invasion by monsters from the planet Mars should have had so profound an effect upon radio listeners. So, as part of his apology, uh, next day afterwards, uh, freaked everyone out. And CBS promised that uh, they, they wouldn't pull something like that again. Uh, but it's very often cited as an example of how credible uh, early audiences are for, for any medium. Uh, it's also, you know, he's he's the director of Citizen Kane, and uh, it was it was, you know, uh, in its day, uh, a, a really good, a really good false documentary. Did <laughs> um, you any of you guys heard that before? What was your what was your feeling about how it was done and stuff? Do you think we'd still be fooled like that nowadays? No. No. Never heard. Maybe. Maybe. That's awesome. There's a lot of hoaxes now that do fool yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. I think it depends what it is. Like, obviously, I don't think, like, alien invasion yeah. would do it. Yeah. Um, but I feel like someone could probably cook something up. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, 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 that guy in Hawaii. The, the, the guy who pulled the false alarm in Hawaii and got fired for it. Right. You know, like, that freaked a bunch of people out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It would, you know. Yeah. And, and part of that is, you know, I, I mean, also people say that this was just before, you know, the total outbreak of World War II as well. So there's kind of a rising paranoia, yeah. you know, and now we've got, you know, all those tensions with North Korea and stuff. It, it amps it up a bit. Mitchell, did you want oh, to no, say No, I just wanted to say that. We all, that's why we've got programs like Prayer Home Companion that acts out, that reenacts that kind of like comedy or something. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, there's actually, I have a bit of another documentary <laughs> with Garrison Keillor on it. He's, he's talking about some stuff like that. That's true. So we'll obviously know if it's like comedy or not. Yes, yeah. I mean, you know, there's, 
there's there's indications now. Yeah, yeah. Ethan. I think people are gonna like believe it if it's like a serious thing, like the thing in Hawaii. But if it's something like like the Spinal Tap documentary, I'm <laughs> gonna believe that that was a real band. Right. Yeah. But if it's like something relating to like life or death, I think people are gonna believe yeah. it because like you're in danger. You are. Yeah, and it's coming through like an EAS, uh, yeah. you know, government channel. You you wouldn't expect information to be wrong, but. Thank goodness it was. Um, well, this brings us up to the Second World War, and there's some stuff that we can come back to in a second that was going on. But uh, so again, like the First World War, uh, during the Second World War, uh, uh, all kinds of things changed for radio. Uh, they stopped manufacturing because they wanted all the raw materials for radar and for other, uh, you know, for other stuff. And, and rather than producing more consumer things, they produced. Uh, um, Radio, radio sets and stuff for the armed forces and stuff. Uh, but the industry also did very well during the Second World War because things like newsprint were rationed. Um, and so, you know, in, in, the, in the competition for advertisers and stuff like that, newspapers just eventually couldn't print enough papers versus radio, which, you know, you could just continue on advertising over the air. So although they weren't making any new radio sets, they were cleaning up in terms of ad sales because newspapers couldn't compete. They didn't have enough newsprint at the time for, uh, for that. Yeah, so as I said, other things were happening because AM radio in this, well, radio in all of what I've been telling you about was AM, uh, which stands for amplitude modulation, which is what our geeky friends from the BBC were showing us. But a whole different system was dreamed up by one of the really, truly great engineer inventors of all time, basically. Uh, a single person, Edwin Howard Armstrong, uh, created FM radio. So you guys, you all have AM, probably you've experienced AM and FM. What are some of the, the differences between AM and FM that you can hear if you're still aware of? Yeah, Mitchell? As far as I remember, back then I used to listen to Radio Disney. That was on AM. And comparing okay. that to like FM radio, I was listening to Paramount Companion at that so, time. I think AM is a little bit more static. It has more static it than It does, FM for sure. Does. That's a good point. Others? Nodding? Parker? He just say brought it back. He brought it back. <laughs> okay, back in the day. So yeah, FM, FM works on a different principle. It's still frequency tuned, but the way that the audio gets sent out on FM is different than AM, and it makes it much less susceptible to, for instance, if there's a thunderstorm or something. You know, all those lightning flashes. They are putting out huge amounts of radio energy too. So they would, you know, they would give you static and stuff. Uh, but FM works on a different principle, so it can reject that static. And so you got a, a, a clearer signal and a better quality. The, uh, the, uh, the audio quality in FM is a lot better, as you guys probably hear. You know, when you tune in a ball game, uh, it's, it sounds nice and loud on AM, but if you tune it in on FM, You'll hear the announcer's voices sound much more natural. There's more kind of high frequencies there. And, uh, and you can just hear stuff better. Uh, so FM, superior sound quality, uh, a good system. But uh, it was created in the 1930s by uh, Howard Armstrong, this great inventor. But it was not implemented. Uh, it took off very, very slowly for about, it took like 20 years or so. So let's go back to our geek friends uh, who have just finished explaining far better than me the difference between AM and FM. But they tell us the story of... Geeks still roughly match the sound that it's making, and the radio waves are actually going rapidly up and down in the middle. Now if I stretch this out a bit, these are the actual radio waves, and you can see what's happening is that the sound is constantly changing their size or their amplitude. And that's why this is called amplitude modulation, or AM radio. The man who designed much of the practical circuitry for AM radio was an American called Edwin Howard Armstrong. While in France during World War I, he invented the superhet circuit, which has been used ever since. 
He then sold a patent to RCA back in America. I have an appointment to see Mr. Sarnoff. Oh, Mr. Sarnoff's expecting you, Mr. Armstrong. Thanks. You're welcome. He became a millionaire overnight and fell in love with the chairman's hey, secretary. Uh, how about you come for a spin in my motor? OK. Hop in there. Oh, it sure is a big one. <laughs> he bought a huge Hispano Suiza and climbed his tallest aerial to impress her. <clears throat> they were married soon afterwards. Will you marry me? Oh, Howard, my hero. The fundamental principles of radio have remained unchanged. This is the BBC transmitter at Brookman's Park, broadcasting medium wave radio to South East England. Inside, the engineers have restored the BBC's very first transmitter, built by the Marco. Oh, this is like one of those gigantic things. And we want to know the story of Armstrong. Well, I don't know if we get it here. So it's not as good, but let me just tell it to you. <laughs> Armstrong, uh, after becoming a rich man, uh, making uh, AM radio as powerful as it could be. Uh, invents FM, goes to his business partner, Sarnoff at RCA, and says, hey, I got this great FM thing. And Sarnoff looks at it and is thinking, look, we just got, you know, 500,000 people to buy AM radio sets. If we tell them all they now it's no good, we got to get an FM set, they're, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna do this. In addition to that, in the 30s, RCA was already pretty close to having TV. So what they were seeing is five to ten years, we're going to try to sell everybody a television, radio with pictures. We don't want to get them spending all their money on a new radio set. So Sarnoff um, said no. He said no to Armstrong, even though Armstrong had a much better system. So Armstrong, being proud, very proud man, um, built his own system, <laughs> built his own test station with huge antenna to prove, you know, the, the greatness of FM, thinking that, you know, the early AM stations had uh, established themselves and made themselves rich, rich businesses by being some of the first that existed. Armstrong foresaw FM as being the next big thing and invested much of his millions in these test stations. Sarnoff stabbed him in the back. He lobbied Congress to uh, um, change the, the FM frequency allocation so that they were not, it wasn't in the frequency band that Armstrong had designed all of his test stations to use. So they, they permitted FM to go forward, but under Sarnoff's lobbying influence, they made all of Armstrong's stations obsolete. So Armstrong sued, uh, and they were in court for like more than a decade. And remember, Sarnoff's secretary was Armstrong's wife. Eventually, uh, you know, and you know, imagine you're even if you're a rich guy fighting NBC uh, is is a you know a long a long battle. Uh, Armstrong eventually committed suicide, a depression from losing all his money. Uh, he didn't lose the court battle. It just went on for so long, they wore him down. Uh, he had a penthouse in New York, you know, near Central Park. Apparently, he put on his leather gloves, like dressed up like he was going out for, a, you know, a, a, a date or something, and then jumped out the window, killed himself after having an argument with his wife. And that was the end of him. But if you look in the New York Times, you can even see stuff that he'd written, you know, thought pieces like how awful it is that the inventors never get credit for what they are and stuff like that. So pretty sad story. A guy who, you know, uh, we still use the super heterodyne circuit that he designed in the First World War in AM uh, uh, receivers. And, you know, FM, uh, the guy made it, you know, he created it himself. So, I mean, clearly like the best, the best mind of, of radio engineering at all. But, and, and you know, a year after he killed himself, RCA settled with the widow and they gave her a million bucks and like they closed down all those court cases that had been going on for 15 years, you know. Uh, so, pretty sad story. It, uh, sad human story in the midst of all that. What's the, uh, what's the benefit of AM over FM? 
it uh, takes less power to send the signal further. So like an AM station has lower costs and can blanket a much bigger area. Uh, and part of that is also just in the licensing. Like there are different levels of FM license. Like a KMEL will have a, a you know an A grade license, which will you know it'll spread the signal maybe 20 miles, versus your basic AM station could reach like 400 miles. So you get these much bigger kind of coverage areas out of AM. You know, and in other parts of the world, you know, it, it's it's the universal standard that's everywhere. Like if you go to Africa, maybe they won't have an FM system, but they will have AM everywhere. So it's, it's really far spread. But there's some weird things. Like has anybody, ever, you know, have you tried tuning in at night? I mean, again, you'd have to have a radio. Not everybody does spend any time with radio. But the AM signal will travel really far. It's a much lower frequency wave. And that means at night, it'll bounce off the ground, it'll bounce off the clouds, and you can get like, you know, Tijuana or something, you know, oh, you know just tuning in on your AM radio, because it travels all over the place. So it's, um, it's different. FM will only go like 10, 15, 20 miles, and that's it. Dill? Have you ever had a chance to play with like ham radios? Uh, yeah, way back when, but yeah. that's a long time ago, yeah. yeah. Actually, I still have a ham radio back home just to like, mess around with it. Pretty cool. Yeah. And what, what can you hear when you tune through? I mean, I, I use it to like tune into like, like radio, like freeway frequencies. You yeah. can hear like CHP officer free frequencies. Yeah. You can hear like, like uh, I don't know, truckers. Like it's, it's yeah. a bunch of weird stuff, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah. One of my first broadcast jobs in the summer was to go pho uh, videotape like car accidents uh -huh. and stuff. Which was a That's thing cool. back in that day. Well, they did, you know, we had a police scanner in yeah. the car, and so yeah. you just listen for like emergency calls. And, and then you'd be like, oh, just off yeah. you go, yeah. Have you, have you seen that movie? It's called Nightcrawler. With Jake yep. Gyllenhaal, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like that. No, but it's, <laughs> it was pretty it boring. It reminds me of that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, no, it's definitely the he same the, It's the, the same whole, thing. Like, yeah. yeah, it's the same thing. This is a film. I don't know if you guys have seen Nightcrawler. It's pretty creepy, but it is. It's just, it's just about a guy who makes a living shooting accidents like that. And eventually, you know, he, he figures, well, why don't I, you know, create something that are even better than the real thing? Uh, yeah. and it starts to get pretty wild. It's, yeah. it's cool, but it was just a boring job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so you know, we talked about AM. We talked about FM. What? So, what happened with FM is it slowly came into use. Um, you know, uh, television came out, and we'll talk next class is devoted to TV and stuff, but television came out and, and uh, uh, you know, it, um, it's, it, it, uh, it took all the energy, it took all the development. The Second World War held everything up, but FM sort of bounced back in the 1960s and, and on for a number of reasons, but number one was the sound quality was better, right? And at that time, you were getting like bands like the Beach Boys, the Beatles, and young people were really getting into the very creative aspects of popular music, you know? Uh, there was a lot of effort made to make this stuff sound cool. So uh, FM radio had that better sound quality, and so that got people getting more into FM radio. Um, and, and, you know, we'll talk about this next class, too, which is a, just basically uh, when TV came along, radio was, like, screwed. I mean, they, they lost their, uh, you know, the, all of those variety shows and everything else. They all went over to TV. Uh, so radio kind of reinvented itself. Uh, we'll get on to that. Um, so, you know, uh, the latest thing, and we talked about, you know, I asked for a show of hands how many people have actually, you know, uh, either use satellite radio or something, but that is a completely different uh, technology in itself, you know. Uh, it can be broadcast from satellites floating over the Earth, uh, or it can also be relayed from tower to tower as well. So the coverage opportunities are, are uh, you, can, you can get the best possible coverage um, from satellite radio. <coughs> FM has a problem in that it's very line of sight. The quality is good, but if you pass behind a big building, you can lose the signal a little bit. You know, downtown especially, it's tough to get a really clean FM signal. Uh, but satellite radio, due to you know the way you can you repeat it, uh, it's it's great quality. It's digital, so it's like CD quality sound, plus, you know, it, it covers everything. And it's a national service, so you can start driving, you know, here and drive 
clear through to uh, you know Sacramento or uh, further on to Las Vegas or whatever, to tune to the same one, right? You never lose it, right? Versus terrestrial radio is very local in its uh, in its coverage, and so you know that's both its uh, its weakness and its strength because you know as we said, radio has become you know being local is an important thing for a regular FM station or something versus your satellite service is providing variety, hundreds of different channels on the service because it's all digital. Um, so it works well. Obviously it finances itself differently. So next class we'll get into, you know, the, the early rise of, of, uh, of, of how networks are going to finance themselves. Uh, but, you know, it, as we said, uh, it was a hard sell to get people to pay for radio that they used to get for free. So they had to merge in 2008. Uh, it hasn't destroyed over the air broadcasting, which they were worried that it would do that. Um, but, you know, it leaves that open local channel option. All right, cool. So next class, we'll finish up on radio and talk about how all this pays for itself. And then we'll get into, you know, TV and stuff. So, uh, next class, uh, your essay is due, right? your media diary is due, so uh, do, do, your, do your darndest to write something interesting and get it.